speaking of your word and a better sense of the Holy Spirit in our own life. We pray that you'll help us to be obedient to your will and by your grace and by your work within our heart, God, help us to just grow in the Spirit. Help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us to resemble the Spirit and the love that is through him to others in this spiritually dying world that needs your love um, beyond comprehension. We thank you so much for our fellowship today. We thank you for the church here, and we just pray that it will grow by your sovereign grace and that you will be with our efforts to um, help that help that come to happen, Lord. We, we pray for all those who visit here and that you'll be with them and bring them back to us if it's your will. We just pray you'll be without, with us throughout the rest of this time today. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. All righty, we're in lesson number five, and we got one more to go. It's taking about three months to get this one. <laughs> Only six lessons. Um, as normal, I'm going to start with Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two, and read to verse twenty-three. Paul says, "But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness." faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. So today we're on faithfulness and gentleness. We've all almost made our way through down the entire list. And um, we'll begin with question number one. Concerning the fruit, the, concerning the spiritual fruit of faithfulness, we know that God is faithful and true. In Revelation 19, I have quoted there, to, I mean, Revelations 19, verse 11, John says, now I, now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. I think that's a powerful verse. You know, this is all. said something and I had a funny smirk on my face because it brought back to memory. You had first stated the scripture you were going to read and then right away again you repeated it except you had it reversed. Oh, did I? Yeah. Sorry. Like instead of I do that a lot 1911, probably. You said 11, I did. Yeah. But that brought back a funny it drives me nuts when I do that. <laughs> hey, you know, it shows you nobody's perfect in their call. It's it's so it's interesting. I I'll catch that when I'm watching a sermon online or I'm listening to something. I'm thinking, how could you do that? Like, it's it's just simple scripture, and then you find yourself doing the exact same thing. Oh boy! Did you? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those will show you. Not perfect. <laughs> That's right. You try so hard. You try. You want to say what you want to say, and then uh, even your efforts are flawed. <laughs> All right. Can you think of a place within the New Testament where God says He wants us to be faithful in blank? Fill the blank. Any scripture that comes to your mind where God says He wants us to be faithful in blank. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that wording pattern, but I think where Jesus will one day say, well, good, uh, exactly, yeah, yeah, enter into the joys of your your king. So, I think of that. Can you think of anything else? Not exactly like that. But yeah, I don't have to be. Peter walked on the water. He had to have faith, mm -hmm. but if you have the faith of whatever, mm -hmm. that's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's a good. There's a good analogy. I've heard that. I've heard a lesson preached on that. That situation over and over and over again. It's about. It's pretty much the same lesson. Uh, but nah, I ain't gonna get into it. That's right. Yep. 
you start sinking and you start focusing on things around you, storms of life, and then you, you don't you gotta keep your eyes on him. My own personal Bible study every day. I like to get up and do it first thing in the morning because the longer the day drags on, I just think I begin to brag a little myself. Yeah, yeah. So yep, yep. That's a, I like that first thing in the morning. That's the best way to start your morning, too. Not the kids are the only ones who do it. Yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> I used to be so, you can call it legalistic in that. I was just dead on. Prayer, study, prayer, go about my day. I'd even have an alarm clock that had time to pray, and I'd have a schedule of what I was supposed to do during the day. Oh, those days are gone for now. They'll be back, Lord willing. So, <laughs> whoo, I tell you. But this makes me think of um, one of our st- um, times of reading in First Corinthians a couple weeks ago. God wants us to be faithful ministers, faithful servants to him. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're struggling, just keep on keeping. Just think of the rewards God plans on giving you. The, the scripture says we cannot even fathom what God has prepared for those who love him. And, you know, I have hard days. All of us have hard days where you got to you got to make yourself think positive thoughts. You got to make yourself stay on that road and uh, Think of the reward aspects of it all. I mean, if you're trying to grasp for straws, think of that. <laughs> Don't feel bad for thinking of rewards. It's like, God said He's going to do it. So, um. I think sometimes you need to also grasp the rewards that you have here on earth, like being the blessings. Able to come to church and yeah. Being able to worship God. And Absolutely. Pray. Yeah. And I, I know that there are lots of years that I would have gone to that I hadn't, didn't miss church. And I remember that there was a kind of rough time and they made sure mom and dad made sure that one of them got us to church yeah that's right now, you know nowadays now that i'm a father before before i was a father i i was able to watch movies with say parents within the movies who had kids and something would happen to the kids or something would happen, and it wouldn't bother me i can't watch a movie now without thinking of my own kids and sometimes it chokes me up and i He's like, no, Gary, you can't do that. Don't, don't do that. And it's just how it makes me think of the how much of a blessing they really are, the gifts that God has given me. I, you know, I do my best never to take that for granted. Even if Jeremiah saying, "Daddy, come in here. No, do this, do that, do this." You know, one of these days I'm not going to hear that. Daddy, come in here. Do this, do that. And one of these days he's going to get older, have his own family. <laughs> yeah, get out. But you know. I will. I know for a fact I'll miss all the toys being spread out. I'll miss, uh, you know, you miss all of that. Yeah. Well, a long way down the road. You'll find yeah. out that he'll think you're much older when he's 13. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Business. yeah. I'm, a, you know, I'm only 27, but I tell you, I don't feel 27 most days. Uh, it's just, man, there are a lot. But I know that, you know, each day is a gift. And, you know, I constantly pray for their salvation, their health. I, you know, it's just, it's, it's and just being with them, having time with them, being that father that they need. So, um, all right. Question number two: Remaining faithful to God in every area of our lives can be a task to accomplish. Can you think of any con- consequences that could come from walking unfaithfully in terms of our relationship? With God. I'll tell you what, this is something I've said this before that, uh, and I've gotten better at it. Mm-hmm. But I am a doer. I want to do it my way. I want to get it done my way, and I want it to be done. And, uh, oh. There are times that you know you can't do that, and then when I finally give it up to the Lord, uh, the consequences of not giving it up, I had all this anxiety and all this worry, and then once you give it up, you just whole burden comes off. It's still there. The problem's still there, but that whole burden just comes off of you, and you know that you can roll and, and go with it. And I, I think for myself personally, a big consequence is walking unfaithfully, especially for me. I grew up in the church. I, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like I'm just learning it or whatever, but I still have trouble sometimes just giving it up um, to the Lord. And, but once I do, that just stress, mm-hmm. everything just rolls right off, and yeah. I'm just able to move on. So personally, that's a consequence I have is uh, the anxiety and stuff when 
I mm-hmm. don't just give it to him and be faithful that he's going to, whatever the answer is, if it's good or bad right at that moment for me, in the end, it's going to be good because it's God's plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Walking unfaithfully destroys our business. I was just about to say that as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> made me, it made me think of First John <clears throat> chapter one, um, verse five to first five to seven. Um, specifically, I guess we could say verse five to uh, ten. I'll read that. John says, "This is the message which we have heard from him, and declare to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness." We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sins. And then verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So yeah, walking in darkness, you practice... You know, you don't, you're not living in the truth, and people can clearly see that. If you, you know, that's, that's a big deal. Have, have you ever met somebody who says that they do not sin? Have you ever met such? I have. I've met a person who would actually tell me that uh, first they they'd struggle with First John one a that says if we see that we have, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Um, that's kind of an off, off topic question. I apologize, but, um, there are, there are people out there that really think that they have no sin or that they don't sin. Um, but I'm not trying to get into that conversation. <laughs> that's another topic, topical conversation. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it yeah, yes. Yeah. They don't understand <laughs> what they're saying. Um, but it, it affects our witness. Um, it affects your fellowship with God. Um, it affects your fellowship with the church because as we're going to, not, not next week, but the week after that, we'll be hitting first Corinthians five. And that talks about church disfellowship on your relationship with other people who, you know, say, say they're children of God and they're living this ungodly life. What Paul tells you to do about it. And I mean, it's a pretty blunt in your face passage of scripture. Um, but it affects your fellowship with church, the church too. So, there's nothing good that comes from it. There's nothing good. I mean, there's not. So, anyone got anything else? Alrighty. Question number three: What kind of servant does Jesus expect us to be? In Matthew twenty-five, verse twenty-one. Matthew 25, verse 21. Do you want to read that? Twenty-five, twenty-one. 21. The Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant. I remember when we were little. I don't know. I was trying to remember if I was like five. But they used to give awards for perfect attendance. Mm-hmm. School. And I remember when I was about five or so, I, I was sick of something, and I you want to go to church, and I said, I'm going to church. I'm going to school. You want that? You want that award? You're perfect attendance. Yeah. So you did go. I I can't remember. This would be you're asking a difficult question. <laughs> you you weren't carrying COVID during that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I always like to go to church, revivals or anything. I mm-hmm. remember Daddy would sometimes when we had all the kids. Or yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But Janet and I always liked them. Nothing wrong with that. Place. Lori was so lit. <laughs> Next question. Can you think of any ways that could help us become more faithful in our walk with God? This makes me think of the necessity of meeting with the church. Meeting with the church as much as you can. Understandably, these are difficult times, but make that a top priority if you can. Like if you can, if your health permits it, and you know you need that. Yeah, I, I always think of an army. You get the Marines out in the battlefield. They need each other. You don't just send one guy out there and expect for him to do all the work. You know, you need each other. You need communication. You need backup. You need to be there for one another. Same exact way with the church. I mean, we're at war spiritually every single day. And the moment we begin to think, oh, well, he's all right. He, he don't need me. You know, we've deceived ourselves. <laughs> you know, it's just, and it, as much as we may think they need us, we need them. It goes both ways. Uh, that's like that's what the church you started about. Yep. Yeah. You know, I read it's a boost. Night and stuff, you know, yep. Whatever. Um, and I watch, I listen to the, uh, listen to, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the radio station, uh, and everything, uh, I just feel like it's me sitting here, just seeing everybody, and being yeah. recharged oh, yeah. by that. Yeah, yeah. And you're recharging others to that. Yep. I mean, right. and you know that they are going to be those fruits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's why I think the, yeah, it, the church is viewed as a family. You're one. As a body in Christ, we, we all have different members of our body, but, you know, I need my hands to do many things. I need my tongue to speak right now. You know, these may be little things. I think they're little, but really they're, they're a big deal. Um, it's just so important to keep that mindset because Hebrews 10.25, there's a, there is a reason why the author, author of that said, do not neglect your meeting. Don't neglect it. As people have a habit of doing, um, I think God knew what he was doing when he <laughs> commanded us over and over again to meet. All righty. Question number four. According to the Bible, what can we expect will happen if we are gentle in our speech with others? In Proverbs 15, verse 1. Specifically, I'm referring to. Yeah. Yep. Proverbs 15, for verse one. Well, you you want you want to read that? <laughs> yeah. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Boy, isn't that the truth? You just, uh, I, you see two people feuding and you want to step in and you want to, hey, be the peacemaker of it all. But before you know it, they may say something to you and cause you to raise your voice a little bit. And you just stir the pot even more. <laughs> uh, so share your own thoughts concerning the scripture if you feel led to do so. Uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. Not all the time, though. And that don't always, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so for me, that would be the opposite. You got to watch out for people who are especially extremely quiet all the time. <laughs> Same thing with my kids. Same thing with the kids. If I hear it's, it's there's a dead silence, I know something's up. Yeah. Uh, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I think when, if someone's speaking harshly, I, and you probably know this with our job, mm-hmm. and so sometimes when they're speaking harshly, stuff they, they they get going or they don't know what they're saying anymore. And if you speak softly, they'll come to match you yeah. instead of you matching them. Yeah. If you can keep under control, and then they can come back into themselves and, and kind of see, or at least let go enough. Yeah. To go away to see, yeah. to sort out. It really you know. does change the environment completely. Not all the time, but for the majority of the time, it does. I yeah, the clients and you know they they may have something that's really on their mind. It's really bugging them, or they may be fighting with another client verbally, and you just say, "Okay, what's going on? Tell me. You go in there. You go in there. Let's talk about it." 
And normally, that settles it. Not all the time. But, uh... And you know, even if what you're saying is right, you raise your voice and get all bent out of shape about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, even your... Or get emphatic. Yeah, right. People begin to back off. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's that's maybe another reason why we're told to correct a brother and sister in love and gentleness with the spirit of gentleness rather than in their face. You sinner, you know you've done wrong, this and that. And yeah, there's two different. This may be true. Absolutely, like you said, it absolutely could be wrong. Yes, all of us do wrong. I mean, let's not be hypocrites. <laughs> we all have issues, but um, there's two different ways on going about it. I think with my kids too. Um, I make it. I make it a habit and an effort to tell Jeremiah. I, I don't mean to put my my son out on <laughs> all the time, but he's he does a lot. A lot he gets in trouble for. But I always tell him, you know, son, this is why. Daddy's talking to you. This is why Daddy's correcting you. Uh, I want to tell him why, not for him to just look at me. Oh, Daddy's yelling at me, or that Daddy's trying to get on to me. You know, this is why because this could have burned you. This could have hurt you. And uh, if you go about it with your kids, as all you who have kids, you know it very well. You get two different reactions as a parent. Uh, you, know, you go to your kid. You know, calm down, calm down. Tell me what's wrong. What's wrong? Let me hit me. Let me hit me. <laughs> Or, yeah, so two different reactions completely. Completely. My, my, my twin sons are quite a bit different. But Mark would always say when he get in trouble, if I start to spank him, he would, he would always say, uh, Matthew, don't look at me. Look at this. This is what happens <laughs> when you do this. And he always says, he was always the one that got spanked. <laughs> they were identical. He was, they're not so much sad anymore. Yeah. Mark always laughed and said, you know, I, I, I think I probably shared this one time. I looked at him and I said, where'd you get that gun? And he was over there on the sidewalk. <laughs> I mean, that's the fact of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be one of these people you had to touch the gun. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, he just picked it right up and I... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well. But he's the healthy one of the two. <laughs> two in the to see what they're, they're both pretty healthy because when they were real little, I had friends that would visit us, an older couple, and she said she would see the boys maybe eating broccoli or spinach or something. And she'd say, I've never seen kids three years old eat like that before. And I says, Why? Well, I don't know the difference. You know, that's the only thing my grandson eats is the good stuff. Mm. I mean, <laughs> he's something. <laughs> well, that's enjoyable to see that, though, when you eat like that. He needs to eat more protein, I think. Mm. He's going to need a little protein. He did eat a whole bacon burger the other day for the second time. So we're being. He's changed. living on the edge right there. <laughs> Watch out. I had tried one of those. Um, well, I've had many bacon burgers. I was thinking of the um, the vegetarian burgers. Have you had those? They're all natural. Okay. Yeah, I need. I I'm not. I'm not a a fan of those at all. But and they cost quite a bit in the freezer at Walmart, and I think four dollars for maybe four or six of them, and they're not worth it. Go eat some grass if you're trying to eat some vegetables before you eat that. <laughs> If you're eating it for a diet, you probably should. Just pound grass in there. Yeah, that's right. That is true. All righty, question number five. Kind of what I, we were just talking about. If a brother or sister is caught in sin, God instructs those of us who are spiritual to restore such a person with the spirit of gentleness. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. 
Question, have you ever seen a Christian try to do this with a judgmental spirit? If so, how did that go? Have you ever had a personal experience? And if not, that's that's great. I'm glad you haven't seen that experience of seeing someone or hearing of someone go about it the wrong way. With someone, say, coming to Christ or maybe struggling with a certain sin in their life and or struggling just coming to meet with the church, anything. And... The Christian who does come to church who doesn't struggle that much decides to, you know, get a little harsh with them and kind of points their fingers at them. And have you ever seen that? Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've witnessed it, and I've, I've heard. There was a story one time. This, these people had they, they weren't regular church. At, attendees you could say they didn't come to church all the time but they did come and i think that's wonderful i mean i'd rather them come more but the fact that they came was great they had a problem sleeping in they just slept in all the time and i think their work schedule I'm not trying to make excuses for them but saying the reality of their life well there's an email sent to them that wasn't so wasn't so nice and uh, they stopped coming i'm pretty sure that was what cut it off um and it's just it really does matter the words you say, how you say them. Um, it makes me think of a movie I watched. It was called A Thousand Words. It, it's a good movie. It's uh, with Eddie Murphy in it. And he has a thousand words. He can. He, that's all he can say. That's all he has left to say. And the, the whole point of the movie really is you need to choose your words wisely. You know, if you had a thousand words to say, you would really, if that's all you had left, if God said, all you have left is 1,000 words to say, and then you're done talking, you would really choose your words wisely. You really would. And I think that's how we have to be as Christians, as just ordinary people every day. Um, especially your conduct that goes along with that. Um, I borrow my grandson's words. He says, love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah, that's true. Love y'all. We love y'all, yeah. I don't worry about that. That's a crafty way of going about it, though. <laughs> but, yeah. Alrighty, we got one more question. Question number six. When discussing the topic of God, Christian, uh, Christianity, religion, etc., with our neighbors, how does Peter instruct us to do this? Why is it so important for us to remember what he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15? First Peter 3, verse 15, Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So, why is it important for us to remember what he said? It's kind of a, I think the more you see atheism, the more you see people attacking Christianity, ignoring facts, even when it's in their face. Um, that is why I think that um, it is essential not only to read your Bible, not only to know your Bible, but this is where I think Christian apologetics is very important. And what that is, is you guys, if some of you don't know, it's just a Christian coming at the Bible Christianity with historical and accurate facts answering questions against those who try to bring uh, or try to say science and God don't go together, evolution versus God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have Christian apolog apologists like William Lane Craig, a guy named Ravi Zacharias, he passed away. But anyway, you have these you have these men who are defending Christianity, not just from the Bible, but from outside sources and answering hard questions that atheists bring. And um, I. I remember listening to a guy named Frank Turek. He's another Christian apologist. And he said he was in front of a church congregation. And he held his Bible up. And he said, why do you believe this is true? Well, number one, faith, absolutely. 
and historical facts go with that. But they, one of the answers he got was, well, because it says it's true. He's like, okay, well, the Quran says that. The Quran says that about itself, too. Does that make it true? No. The, the logical answer was no. And so, and he gave us statistics of the reason why most people leave the church when they get older is because they were never talked into it. Meaning, many people read the scriptures and they just accept what their parents tell them, and, and they don't really think it out for themselves. And uh, that is why a lot of college students leave. So this is, it just makes me think of the importance, not that it's absolutely necessary, but it does. Like when you get in a conversation with an atheist or someone, they're normally, they normally know a lot, maybe, about the Bible. They think they do. Exactly. They think they do. Yeah, right. Yeah, and they want to use that against you. They want to, they're coming with the, most of them, not all of them. But they, they have preconceived ideas. They already have an agenda, and they want to ask you for the reason of the hope that is within you. And then. Okay. I just just the. What, yeah, okay. The logic behind all that is <laughs> just, that's that's if you really work hard. I tell you, yeah, that's right. I tell you. Well, we gotta love them. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yep, and it just makes me think. Like Paul said, we can we can plant the seed, we can water, but you know, you leave the rest to God. You just leave it to him. And you just you continue to be faithful to him, continue to serve him, continue to love him, continue to love your brothers and sisters. And that, I mean, you do what you do. You do what God has given you the capabilities to do. And don't get down on yourself that that person does not come to the gospel. That's not your fault. And you know, I say that because some Christians tend to think that it's their fault when someone does not accept the gospel invitation. Uh, well, that's not the case at all. And Satan would love for us to think that. Um, so it's important to always have a reason to or an answer to give to those who ask us why we believe what we believe and a testimony to share. So that's it. That's it with this lesson. I, I, we already went through the six questions, and the last last lesson will be on self control. And self control kind of just has all those spiritual fruits in one packet. I think self control could be defined by that because. Without self-control, I mean, you really, you're going to have a hard time following the other fruits of the Holy Spirit. Self-control is a main piece within the Holy Spirit. And of course, <laughs> we were kind of, we were kind of, uh, we were saying something about that last week, I think. It's, if you want to, if you want to grow in the whole, if, if, if you want to be healthy, if you don't want to gain weight if you want to eat right. Don't surround yourself with the Wendy's, with the McDonald's, with other restaurants around you. Because you're going to have a hard time of doing that. You're going to have a hard time of making your goal. And you need to surround yourself with the right things, such as... There you go. <laughs> That's going to help you. <laughs> wow. Is it uh, unopened? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Is it unopened? Oh, wow. That, people will go crazy for that stuff, too. They will. They will. You know, those Dr. Seuss books are going like crazy right now. Uh, like, like, crazy. Well... We don't have anything else. That's that's it for today's Bible study, and Lord willing, we'll meet next Sunday. And absolutely, um, again, remember Jacob and uh, family, friends. Okay. All righty. Let us pray. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. He of the three daughters, Jacob's the only, only grandchild. Yeah. So all the three of the, his dad and his brother. Yeah. He's the one. And 
Yeah. Uh, I imagine so. He's, he's, he looks like he's doing a good job of it, though, from what I can see. So. All righty, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we've been able to come and just read your word and learn from it. We know that this pleases you and that it makes you happy to see us be doing this. And we come, in, we come into this building with one spirit looking to serve you and worship you and to come to know you better. Lord, we pray that you'll help any area of our life that is not guided by the Holy Spirit. Please forgive us when we fall short, God, when we make stupid decisions in life, make dumb choices. We are still of the flesh here in this world, and even our best of choices, God, are flawed at times. And Lord, we just we trust in you and help us to rely on you completely to get through any trial and tribulation that we face in our life and to rely on you for the strength to persevere in good works and persevere in good attitude and good character and especially in times where it may be easier to um, say words that would stir up anger than say words that would um, calm a storm lord we we just we ask that you'll be with our efforts and with our hearts and just be with our church please be with all those who have been mentioned today and those who are not here this morning um, we just pray for them please be with their hearts please be with their minds Please be with their spirits and just please guide, guard, and direct them and help them to make decisions in their lives to um, please you and bring glory to you. Pray you'll be with us as we go home, and we thank you again for this weather today. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.